psychology students. Uh, we're going to have a test uh, tomorrow, and it'll be uh, March the 1st. And um, this lecture video is the first video for the third test coming up about four weeks from now. And here we go. So um, this is the first video for test number three. And we are still on chapter number six. When you think about sedimentary rocks, don't forget they form at the surface of the earth in every depositional environment you can think of where sediments can accumulate to make sedimentary rocks. They can form on a in a river channel, on a river flood plain. Uh, once it, when a, over, a river overtops its uh, channel and there's a flood, then um, fine-grained sediment is deposited onto the flood plain. We also have barrier islands. I'm going to show you that. It's another depositional environment, beaches, glaciers, deserts, shallow ocean, deep ocean. And so what we want to do when we look at sedimentary beds is we want to not just only be able to name the sedimentary rocks and figure out its texture, but we also want to figure out the depositional environment that formed the sedimentary rocks we're looking at. And living here in the year 2021, I can't show you holograms. So everything's going to be on two dimensional um, PowerPoints. But when you think about sedimentary rock bodies, remember there are three dimensional bodies of sedimentary rock. And they, um, there are clues in those sedimentary rocks, those three-dimensional bodies that tell you where those rocks formed. We talked about the fact, for example, that limestones usually form in the shallow ocean and cherts and flints form in the deep ocean. Conglomerates form in a river. Coal forms in swamps. So let's take a look at some um, um, clues. We, we already looked at the sedimentary structures. Uh, the other thing you can look at that's quite useful in determining depositional environment is the fossils. Imagine for a moment that you're not taking this class, historical geology, and you're just trying to get a good grade, but that you're a geologist and you look at some sedimentary beds and first thing that should go in your mind is where did it form and what type of depositional environment did it form? The fossils are a dead giveaway, aren't they? For example, if the fossils you find in the sedimentary rock you're looking at, let's say it's a limestone, have bivalves in it. Bivalves are organisms that have two shells, such as oysters and clams and mussels, scallops. Where do those exist in the modern world? They exist in the shallow ocean. So if you find such fossils in a rock, you're looking, that's a dead giveaway that that rock formed in the shallow ocean. There are other creatures that only live in the deep ocean, such as radiolaria and diatoms. Radiolaria and diatoms are a form, a type of life called plankton and diatoms. They're really tiny creatures that live in the ocean. In a drop of seawater, you might find a thousand of them. And let me show you what they look like. Radiolarians are plankton. They're single-celled creatures. They're asexual. They don't have gender. And they reproduce asexually. Here we can see what they look like. Floating in the water. Notice all the spikes they have in their bodies. These are found in cherts and flints. And these only live in the deep ocean. So their tiny shells are called tests. 
T-E-S-T-S, tests, or singular test. Here's a singular, here's a single radiolarian test. Here's a whole bunch of radiolarian tests. The animal lives inside of this test, and it filters the water. So they're filter feeders. These radiolarians, if you cut open a chert or a flint, that's what you'll find in them. Radiolarians and other plankton like diatoms, which look like this. Some of them are quite beautiful. They look like this. They're also, they float in the water. They're single-celled creatures. They're asexual single-celled creatures. They clone themselves to form new generations of organisms. So they don't reproduce sexually. These are found in cherts and flints. If you find freshwater fish bones in the rock, obviously that rock formed probably in a lake where fresh water fish would live. If you find a dinosaur in a rock, that rock formed on the land because the dinosaurs only lived on the land. So fossils are very, very useful, but the big things like dinosaurs are hard to find uh, and reptiles and mammals. So microfossils are particularly useful in determining the depositional environment where sedimentary rocks form. So you can use sedimentary structures, which we talked about in the previous lab, uh, lectures, or you can also use fossils to determine what depositional environment did that sedimentary rock form. There's three main areas where sedimentary rocks are formed, where sedimentation occurs. And we have continents, that's another way of saying the la on the land, that would include rivers and lakes, floodplains, which are also part of the river, river deltas, when rivers en enter into the ocean or into a lake, you form a delta. That would also be a continental environment. Swamps and bogs, deserts, those are all continental environments, anything that's on the land. Marine environments are mean it's underneath the ocean. 70, at the moment, 78% of our planet is covered by oceans. And you have shallow sea floor, and that would be the continental shelf and the continental slope. You'd find certain types of rocks tend to form in the shallow ocean, especially limestones. Deep ocean, we've got cherts and flints form from radiolarians and diatoms. Cherts and flints form in the deep ocean. Transitional environments are in-between environments, places along the coastline. Some people could also call it the shoreline. The shoreline and coastline is the same thing. That's where the land meets the ocean. We find beach deposits. We find, uh, what else do we find along the coastline? Well, we can also find deltaic deposits, deltas there. So deltas could be considered transitional. Uh, we, we form lagoons, and I'll show you what a lagoon environment looks like. We find coral reefs in the shallow ocean, in the shallow marine. But in each of these different environments, you find different types of fossils, Let's take a look at some of these depositional environments where sedimentary rocks form. In the deep ocean, we form cherts and flints from radiolarians and diatoms. We talked about graded bedding before, uh, formed by these submarine fans, which are formed by turbidity currents. And the sediments deposited onto the continental rise, which is at the base of the continental slope that you have graded bedding. We find reefs in the shallow ocean. We'll take a look at reefs. Let's take a look at some real quick here.
I don't know. Have you ever been on a cruise or have you been to the Caribbean? If you have, you might have gone scuba diving. And you see these beautiful coral reefs that form in the shallow ocean. So if you find coral fossils inside of a sedimentary rock, you know it formed in the shallow ocean. But you know more than that. The principle of uniformitarianism. Corals only live in warm, shallow, clear, sunlit waters. So if you find coral fossils in sedimentary rocks, they're usually found in limestones, you know that the area that where you found those rocks used to be covered by a warm, shallow, clear, sunlit sea, such as you have in the Bahamas or Bermuda or in Jamaica in the Caribbean. Let me ask you a question. We find corals here in East Tennessee in rocks that are 390 million years old, covering Oak Ridge and Knoxville, all the way up to Scott County. What does that tell us about East Tennessee 390 million years ago? It tells us that this East Tennessee was a tropical area like the Caribbean, covered by a shallow sea, maybe 10 to 30 feet deep, and the water was clear. Corals can't live in water that's filled with sediment. It kills because corals are filter feeders. They filter the water and it would clog up the holes where they get their food. So, they, so the water must have been clear. There also must have been a lot of sunlight. It was a tropical environment, a shallow ocean. And so reef deposits, we'll look at those as well. Barrier islands and river deltas and beaches and stream environments. Streams include rivers too. Um, we could talk about desert environments and glacial environments. They all have their own characteristic sedimentary rock deposits. If you want to do well in this next test, for each of these depositional environments you see on this diagram from your book, know what type of sedimentary rocks you're going to find. Let's take a look at a barrier island for a moment. Have you ever been to the North Carolina coast or Gulf Shores or the Jersey Shore? Well, if you have, you know what a barrier island is. Here's a picture of what a barrier island looks like. Here you can see an island made of sand along the coast, like we have off the coast of North Carolina, Georgia, Virginia, all the way up to Maine and into Canada. We have these islands that are parallel to the shore, made of sand quartz sand. How do you think these are going to get preserved in the rock record? They're going to get preserved as what type of sedimentary rock? Quartz sandstone, right? So these will get preserved as quartz sandstones. And here's the mainland here. Here you can see a river flowing into the ocean. So you might get a delta deposit right here. This whole area in between the barrier islands and the mainland along coastlines is called a lagoon, such as Chesapeake Bay or Delaware Bay up north. And the waves crash on the seaward side of the barrier islands so that there's almost no wave energy landward of the barrier islands in this lagoon area. Another way of saying it is, there's very little water current. There's quiet water here in the lagoons. Therefore, people will dock their ships in berths in the lagoon, and they'll take their ship 
out into the open sea in between the barrier islands where you have inlets. An inlet is a body of water between barrier islands. And then they'll take their ship out into the open sea. Then we're, when they're done, they'll go back into the lagoon and dock their ship again. Well, you got quiet water here. So fine-grained sediments tend to accumulate in the lagoon, like clay. What type of sedimentary rock do you think is going to form from a lagoon? Well, what type of sedimentary rock is made of clay? Shale. So the barrier islands themselves will be preserved as quartz sandstones. But the lagoon rocks are going to be preserved as shale. Let's take a look at it uh, along the coast. See what these barrier islands look like? Here you can see a typical barrier island here. Here's a barrier island. There's the mainland over here. Here's a lagoon where the sh sh this is eventually going to become shale. Here's an inlet. Sandy beaches. Real estate here is very expensive, by the way. A small house will cost you $400,000, $500,000 on a lot of these barrier islands. In the Jersey area, they're in the millions. Anyway, that's another depositional environment. Another depositional environment you, we need to learn about is beaches and beaches. You already know what kind of sedimentary rocks are going to form from beach sand. You're going to form quartz sandstones. And the sand is going to usually be very equant and rounded and well sorted. Like this, like you see here. Beach sand. You might find some shell fragments here too from little bivalves that live in the shallow ocean but when their shells get crushed by the waves, they get moved onto the beach. Another depositional environment we need to learn about is a river delta. And river deltas are places where rivers enter into the ocean or in, or into a lake, but usually it's in the ocean. And here you can see the Nile River Delta. The Nile River flows north and deposits all of its sediment into this big wedge-like deposit. You can see all the vegetation here. 95% of the farming done in Egypt is done in the Nile River Delta. These tend to be very biologically rich areas, river deltas. And when the river flows downstream, it moves into these little rivulets and fans out to make this wedge-shaped deposit. And this is a deltaic deposit. These are delta sands. Here's the Mississippi River Delta, for example, flowing all the way north from Minnesota down to New Orleans. And you can see the tributary, the, I'm sorry, the distributaries. Distributaries are where the the river fans out into these little rivulets and deposits sediment. Look how biologically rich these areas are. Why do I keep mentioning that? Well, this, because oil, natural gas, and coal are f what we call fossil fuels. And those are associated only with sedimentary rocks. Because only sedimentary rocks have fossils in them. And... These old river, so this is a river delta forming right now. It's called the Mississippi River Delta. But let's take a look at the Mississippi River over the past 7,000 years. So 
This is the current Mississippi River Delta. But these are some old river deltas that were formed when the Mississippi River was flowing in different directions. So um, this river delta here was formed when the Mississippi River was fl flowing further to the north here about 1,000 to 2,800 years ago. This one here is when the Mississippi River was flowing this way farther to the west, making a, an ancient river delta, which we can identify by looking at the rocks very carefully. These old river delta, deltas, ladies and gentlemen, are extremely valuable to our economy because delta deposits, since they are filled with living animals and plants that have died in them and they're biologically rich, they are wonderful storehouses for oil and natural gas. This particular map showing the older river deltas of the Mississippi River was generated by petroleum geologists working for the ExxonMobil Corporation and has generated hundreds of billions of dollars to the U.S. economy. So delta deposits are wonderful storehouses for oil and natural gas. Don't forget that, please. Deltas. Usually they're quartz sandstones too, but you can see the pattern of the rocks is almost lobe-shaped like this. And geologists can recognize that. When you think of rivers, rivers usually are going to form conglomerates where you've got rounded pebbles because as the pebbles get carried downstream they become rounder and more equant. So conglomerates usually form in a river but it can also form in the shallow ocean as the waves move pebbles back and forth in the surf zone they can get rounded. So you have to look in between these pebbles and see if you can find any microfossils to tell you did it form in a river or in the shallow ocean. Obviously if you find shells of marine creatures in it, it probably formed in the shallow ocean. If you find microfossils of freshwater fish then it probably formed in the river. Lakes. Lakes are good places where shale can accumulate. But you might recall lagoons are also a good place where shale would form. So let's say you find a shale and you, you think, oh, maybe it formed in a lake or a lagoon. How would you tell? Look at the fossils. If you find freshwater fossils, it probably formed in a lake. If you find marine fossils in it, it formed in a lagoon. You might remember cross-bedded sandstones form in the desert. So we talked about them looking like this. When you see structures like this with steep cross bedding, it was, that's formed by the wind. These court, this is a single bed here, here's another bed, here's another bed. And notice the laminations in each of these beds are going in different direction. As the wind changes direction, it produces another set of cross bedding. Cross bedding is a sedimentary structure when, when the cross bedding is steep like this, it's a, it means that you're dealing with wind blown deposits, which are formed in a desert or on a beach. How would you know the difference? Well, once again, look at the fossils. If you find desert organisms, the, the remains of them in these rocks, sometimes they'll be so small you need to look under a microscope, it formed in a desert. If you find marine creatures that were washed onto the seashore, like uh, bivalves, for example, or coral fragments, then it probably formed on a beach. Another sedimentary structure, uh, structure that's quite common in the desert, I don't know, know if you've ever been to the desert before, but in deserts you'll find things that look like this 
if you haven't been out west, um, you haven't seen these yet. But when you go out to Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, you're going to see these desert mountains. Look how little vegetation there is in the desert. And these canyons. And then you'll find these lobe-shaped sed sediment deposits. These are called alluvial fans. And they're at the base of desert mountains. Where does all this sediment come from, do you think? You might think that it was blown in there by the wind. But you'd be wrong. In, actually, in the desert, large amounts of sediment are moved by water. How, how can that be? You told me there isn't that much water in the desert. We know there's not too much water in the desert. Well, when it rains, huge amounts of sediment are moved down these canyons. They're called arroyas. And they're deposited onto these alluvial fans. The coarser grain stuff gets is concentrated here in the center. And then you get finer grain sediment as you move farther to the ends of the alluvial fans. These are recognizable by geologists. And the, an alluvial fan deposit is going to have coarser grain sediment here. Maybe pebbles. So you have a little bit of conglomerate here. And then sands farther away. And this would form in a desert environment. Notice how the road goes all the way around here. Because when it rains, you want to stay off those desert roads. And that's why they built the road going around here. Otherwise, you'll be buried by sediment when it rains. People in the Las Vegas area know that. You don't drive along these desert mountain roads when it rains. Because the sediment's going to move off the sides of the mountains. And f cover up these areas. So an alluvial fan deposit is another type of sedimentary deposit formed in the desert. Up north in Canada and northern Russia and Greenland and Antarctica, there are places that are covered by ice, sometimes tens of feet thick, sometimes thousands of feet thick. So you can, most of the land or all of the land is covered by ice in some cases. The ice moves large amounts of sediment. And when that ice is deposited, it commonly forms a glacial deposit called glacial till. If you're from up north, you, you know what this looks like. If you've never been up north, you haven't seen this yet. When you go to Canada, you're going to see um, lots of this. And this, where did all this sediment come from? Look how uh, it's all poorly sorted. It's got si par different particle sizes all mixed together. This is dumped out by the ice. And this is called glacial till, T-I-L-L. -L. These will get preserved in the rock record usually as breccias. But notice all the angular particles here. P notice how poorly sorted it is. So... Breccias, and sometimes conglomerates, but more commonly breccias, will form from glaciers. So each of these depositional environments has little clues we can look for to figure out where did the sedimentary rocks form. We want to know what depositional environment do they form in. Swamps and bogs are where we form coal. So coal is going to form in real boggy land like this and where you have a, um, just a couple of inches of water and lots of vegetation. When the plants die, they fall into the water and oxygen is removed from the water by these dead plants and the organic matter accumulates and over millions of years it becomes coal. So coal is formed in what depositional environment? A, rivers, B, the shallow ocean, C, a lake, or D, a swamp or bog? D would be the correct answer, right? So try and figure out 
how to identify each of these depositional environments and rewind this video if you want some more hints on that. Another depositional environment is called a Playa Lake. So out in the desert, you got these small bodies of water, these little lakes, and they end up drying up and they leave behind chemical sedimentary rocks, rocks that are formed from evaporation. And you'll have things like rock salt and rock gypsum form in these playa lakes. And they look like this. They're salt crystals, the same kind of salt that's in your salt shaker. They're used to season food. They're also used to melt snow. Another type of sedimentary rock associated with these playa lakes in the desert is rock gypsum. Rock gypsum looks like this, and it's made of the mineral gypsum. These are mined to make wallboard, drywall. Don't forget, geology is about making money. It's about finding natural resources that can be sold at a profit. And geologists are responsible for, for finding these ancient Playa Lake deposits to find salt, Morton Salt hires geologists, for example, or the dry people companies that make drywall need to find rock gypsum from ancient Playa Lake deposits. Let's take a look at a river for a moment. And that includes creeks as well. Here's a typical river. You know that a river flows from upstream to downstream in the river channel. So the river flows through the river channel. And sediment is carried downstream by a river. It'll con And this river can move sand, which will be preserved as quartz sandstones, or it can move rounded pebbles, in which case it w uh, that would be conglomerate. So rivers are going to usually be preserved with asymmetrical ripples in conglomerate or quartz sandstone. This area in brown is called the floodplain. The old time settlers used to call this bottomlands, and it would they would this floodplain land is high, was highly treasured because when a river overtops its banks, it'll flood the floodplain and fine-grained sediment will be deposited onto the floodplain. So that the floodplain is usually preserved as siltstones or shales. These can be found in the rock record. If you find the river channel, you know on both sides you're going to have a floodplain. Here you can see typical desert deposits. In the desert, again, you have your playa lakes. The water evaporates and you have rock salt precipitate out or rock gypsum. And then you have these alluvial fans in deposits. And then you have the quartz sandstones with a steep cross bedding. So that, that, that's how, think about it. How, how are we going to reconstruct Earth history? We're going to look at these sedimentary rocks, figure out which depositional environment existed at, at each different location and how they changed with time. Then, with the combined efforts of tens of thousands of geologists around the world, we can reconstruct what the Earth looked like 380 million years ago. And then we can see how it changed by looking at 400 million year old rocks from the past and then we can look at 450 million year old rocks and go even further in the past then we can see how the landscape at each location changed with time
That's what we do in historical geology, is we reconstruct Earth's history. When you go to Greenland, Antarctica, northern Canada, northern Russia, most, much of the land is covered up by ice. And these are called glaciers. The ice is not clean. It's filled with debris. As the ice moves down slope, because gravity carries everything down slope, the gravel and pebbles and everything in the ice is going to bump up against the ground underneath it and tear up new chunks of rock. These are going to get deposited by the ice to make that glacial till that we were talking about earlier on. Poorly sorted sediments. So you should now know what to look for when you, or you, a depositional environments. Are you looking at a delta? Do you see a fan-shaped deposit of sand that's filled with biological material making natural gas and oil? Or is it a beach where you have well-sorted quartz sand that is rounded and smooth and perhaps it has bivalve fossils crushed up into little pieces in between the individual sand grains? Or are you looking at a barrier island beach in which you have an elongate body of sand and land water that you'd have a lagoon where you'd have shale being deposited. And you'd also have river deltas flowing into the lagoon forming lobate um, sand deposits. Sand dunes found in deserts, cro steeply, steep cross bedding. What are tidal flats? Well, if you're not from the coastline, that's another depositional environment that we need to take a look at. Tidal flats are these places. So sometimes you have sand on a beach at the coastline. And we already know what that is going to get preserved as. It'll be well-rounded, uh, equant, smooth, well-sorted quartz sandstones, perhaps with some shell fragments of creatures that live near the shoreline. But other parts of the coastline aren't um, where the ocean meets the land are covered by these tidal flats, which are um, usually found... Um, so this is the mainland, and further off is your barrier island. So this is going uh, uh, right on the edge of a lagoon on the mainland side where you have silts and clays accumulate. So these would get preserved as silt, stones, and shales. And you would have the creatures of um, that like estuary conditions. What is an estuary? E-S-T-U-A-R-Y. An estuary is a place, um, it's in a lagoon, a lagoon environment. Because, let's go back to our barrier island again. So, here's a, a well-developed barrier island. Sandy Beach, look at all the houses here. People like to live on these. Here's your lagoon. And a lot of times you'll have these tidal flats on, along the edge of the mainland. And sometimes you'll have sandy beaches. And the sandy beaches are usually located near the river deltas. Where sand is being deposited to form a river delta. The waves, currents, and tides redistribute the sand. But in places that the, where the beach does not cover up these areas, you're going to have these tidal flats where silt and clay can be deposited, forming siltstones and shales. And these are called estuaries, these areas in the lagoon, right next to the mainland. Estuaries. Estuary, if you look in the dictionary, it's a place where salt and fresh water mix together because the rivers flow into the lagoon. And so this area behind the barrier island, landward of the barrier island, is filled with brackish water. Brackish means um, that salt and fresh water mix together. So there's the water out here is real salt water. Here it's mixed in with fresh water. Certain organisms prefer this brackish water. 
such as blue crab and certain and many types of oysters. So that's why when you want to go for oysters or blue crab, if you want to harvest those, they're found usually in the lagoon. Well, those are going to get preserved in the rock record in tidal flat deposits, in these lagoonal deposits. Here's a river delta again. And rivers flow, when they flow into the ocean, they're going to leave behind a sandy wedge-shaped delta deposit with the river spreading out in all different directions to form what we call distributaries. There's going to, and this is what they look like, this is what the sedimentary rocks will look like. And geologists can recognize that and know it's a delta deposit. It's usually filled with oil, natural gas, and you're going to see these distributaries in them. Then the waves, currents, and tides move some of the sediment off of the delta to form sandy beaches offshore in some areas, and those will get preserved in the rock record as well. Here you can see some other examples of river deltas. Here's the Mississippi River Delta with its distributaries. It, deltas get preserved in the rock record. And we always like to find old deltas because rivers change course and they make new deltas and they leave behind the old deltas. If we can find the old deltas, we can find oil and natural gas. And that's where the money is to be made for many geologists. Here you can see the Nile River flowing into the Mediterranean Sea. And you can see how much vegetation there is here in the Nile River Delta. This will eventually form oil and natural gas. Here's the Braha Tamatru in India, uh, I'm sorry, in uh, Bangladesh, and sediments being deposited here, forming a river delta. Here's your barrier island, it gets preserved as quartz sandstone. Sometimes you have sand dunes on the barrier island, so you're going to have some cross, steeply uh, inclined cross bedding in your quartz sandstones. Here's your lagoon. Here you've got tidal flats. Sometimes you have a little beach here too. Here and these will get preserved as shales and siltstones. Once again, in the deep ocean, you form radiolarians and diatoms, and they fall to the ocean bottom to make cherts and flints. Here's the shallow marine area where you oftentimes will find graded bedding on the continental rise. You might find some coral reef deposits if, there are, if it's a warm, shallow, clear sunlit waters. And then you go to the deeper ocean where you form cherts and flints. This shows you what types of sediments are found in different parts of our oceans. Here you can see you have some clays being deposited in the deeper ocean that will make shale. But you also form these areas in purple here and medium purple where you form cherts and flints. You're going to find radial areas and diatoms in these sediments. And these light purple areas are where you're going to form limestones in the shallower parts of the ocean. Once again, our barrier islands. We only have barrier islands, by the way, on the east coast and the gulf coast, not on the west coast. Wherever you have barrier islands, that means that the ocean has invaded into the land. And we've had a transgression on our east coast and our gulf coast. So the barrier islands back during the ice age were part of the mainland. But then this area behind the barrier islands got flooded by seawater as sea level rose. Now why don't we find barrier islands on the west coast? Because the land has been rising faster than ocean. the ocean has been rising over the last 10,700 years. Remember the ice age, the Pleistocene ended 10,700 years ago. 
So sea level has been rising over the last 10,700 years, flooding our east and our Gulf Coast, making these barrier islands. But on our west coast, the land has been rising faster than the sea level has been rising. So we have, don't have any barrier islands. Instead, we have sea cliffs. Let me show you what it looks like on, out west. So on the, our west coast, looks like this. There's no barrier islands here. Instead, you have these sea cliffs because the land has been uplifted faster than sea level has been rising over the last 10,700 years. And so instead you're going to get beach sands no, right here forming uh, quartz sandstones where rivers flow into the Pacific Ocean. Again, steeply bedded quartz sandstones that's cross bedding formed by the wind, which forms either on a beach or in the desert. So this is formed in the beach or a desert. Then you have to look at the rocks, to the microfossils between the sand grains and figure out did it form in the beach or the desert. So once we can fit, once we figure out what depositional environment different rocks formed in, then we can make paleogeographic maps. What are paleogeographic maps? Paleo means ancient. So this is the ancient geography of our west coast here, and it's in the late Cretaceous. So it was about, um, I would say about 65 to 80 million years ago, this is what our west coast looked like. And you can see different kinds of facies here. These green areas here mark the edge of the coastline 65 to 80 million years ago. And here you've got alluvial fans, so this was desert in this little area here. Coal swamp over here, so there was a swamp over here. And so we can reconstruct marine shales over here. Oh, I'm sorry, there's marine shales here. So, the, so basically this area here, from here to here, all of this area from beige to pink to burgundy this whole area was underwater underneath the ocean and the green area here we find land rocks rocks that form on the land so the coastline was here and this was underwater all to the east and this area here was underwater underneath the ocean we can Geologists had to go to each of these locations and figure out locations and figure out where these depositional environments were to trace out the location of the ancient coastlines and deserts and beaches and swamps. And that's how we know what things were like in the past. And then we do that for other rocks that are younger and older. And we can see how that location has changed with time. In this area here, was about 40 million years ago in the Wyoming, Colorado, Utah area. What did we have? We had lots of alluvial fan deposits, meaning that these areas here in yellow were desert. Then we found rocks that formed up in the mountains here. So this is where the mountains were. And the floodplains are over here in green. So there were rivers and lakes and there was areas in between with deserts in this area here back then. It's a lot of work to make one of these paleogeographic geogra maps. You have to understand your depositional environments when you're looking into Earth's history. Okay, we'll call it, uh, I'll make another video soon.
to turn this off. How do you turn this stupid thing off? I guess this last part of the video, you're going to watch me vape. Isn't that exciting? Okay, I'll see you in the next video.